kinds of things. Remember, uh, at the end of the conference, we tend to ask people to stick around, help us clean up. So do, please do that. You might get a t-shirt out of it, I think. I don't know. I can't promise anything, but uh, we love it, to having people. We have no official cleanup staff, and the more you can do to help us, especially if you see people who you know are like a brain trust of the conference, like Mitch Altman, don't let him sort out his wires. Last time at the end of the conference, he was like sorting wires and bits of solder, being like, I have to pack this. I'm like, no, Mitch, you need to tell people what everything is all about and not just the wires. I love him. He just has very close attention to things sometimes. Um, yes, also, um, when you leave this room and when you leave any room today, please, once again, we have no cleaning staff, take that Starbucks cup under your chair. I know you brought one with you or something. It's not Starbucks, water, whatever. Uh, anyway, I will, um, given that I've given my Olive Garden anecdote, I'm going to let Nick Farr uh, continue the introduction of Johannes. Uh. All right, good morning. I actually have a couple of announcements of my own. Um, one, if you work for the MTA, the people that run the transit here, please tell your staff to keep their tool chests locked in every station. Um, th th thing, thing number two, you need to have better metal bits, or I'm sorry, better metal blades for your reciprocating saws. Uh, thing number three, uh, the payphone that I left in the lockpicking village is still unlocked. So if you know anything about unlocking payphones and getting it open, you can, you can keep all of the change inside, um, but uh, I, just, I just would like the locks picked off of that, that payphone. Um, and and just, just to, to cover all bases, Verizon has officially decommissioned all of their own payphones in the city. So if you happen to see a payphone in a subway station and happen to be in a subway station with an unlocked tool chest that happens to have a battery-powered reciprocating saw in it, Uh, but no, I, I'm serious. I, I dropped off a payphone in the lockpicking village yesterday, and they have been working on it for a solid 14 hours, and they have not yet gotten it open. I think after after I introduce Johannes, I'm going to probably go figure out if I can buy some stainless steel drill bits and a drill somewhere and put the lockpickers to shame. You, oh, Gus, Gus has a drill? I, I know the drill points. It, and, and we have somebody who knows the drill points. Thermite. Thermite. Bernie, you're an organizer of the conference. Should you really be advocating that the attendees use thermite on the mezzanine? Nick, if you were here at the first hope, you will remember I, that the, there was an explosive device that was detonated on stage here at, at the closing ceremony. So, so Bernie was saying that... It was, a, it was a clipper chip that we actually blew up on stage with a small uh, explosive device. So, so Bernie's actually saying that at the first hope, there, were, there was an explosive device... Which leads to the first rule of security, which is no explosives. It was <laughs> if, if, you, with other if, if, if you actually go talk to, to Rody or Cushion, actually, could we have a huge round of applause for the security guys? They are managing so much stuff. They are, in fact, protecting you from yourself. And that's really so. Well, I mean, the funny thing is, that we had just a, a small little minor medical thing back here. And, you know, in addition to, you know, dealing with gigantic overflowing rooms from Snowden, you know, anytime an attendee has some kind of medical problem or some kind of security problem, they, they do a really, really great job of dealing with that. And, you know, Rody and Cush and that whole crew is really awesome. And uh, they deserve all of our love and support. Uh, but if you actually go down to the security team and ask them, they have, they have a list of seven rules um, for, that are obviously related to incidents that happened at previous hopes, and the first one is no explosives. So please don't use thermite on my payphone. Um, but anyway, you're, you're not here to hear me beg for people to open up the payphone. Um, so the, the name of this talk is Fuck Hacker Fox. And I forget the second part, but I think you, you get it from just the, the, an audience bashing you get from the first part. And I've known Johannes for, I actually met Johannes right here in this room. 2006. In 2006. And you were sitting in the first row and you're like. <laughs> and, 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 I re and I remember thinking like, who is this Marxist? <laughs> doing all of these things. And then, and then of course, since, since then we, we, we've actually, become. Neo-Marxist, but let's. Ne Neo-Marxist. <laughs> Uh, of, of course, do, do, do not call a neo-Marxian Austrian a Marxist Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> right, I could just call you a German, how about that? At least I'm not from Detroit. Yay. 
The bashing starts. The bashing starts. Don't take him out while he's down, man. No, this no, 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 no. This is good. But I mean, where, where else did I learn how to use reciprocating saws in subway stations? <laughs> I mean, any, anybody from Detroit, you know, because, you, you, you know, I was thinking most, okay, just, just quick, quick audience poll. But, I mean, you get the reference. I How, mean, actually, I don't want to be Cleveland, so, but that's... Um. Yeah, <laughs> poor Cleveland. So, I, I think a lot of, I, I actually was, was hearing, hearing earlier on, um, you know, pe people would come up to me, they think I know something. I had nothing to do with this conference this year. I, I decided to take the year off, and people are asking me, so, Nick, what's, what's up with that hacker roast that's happening at one? I said, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the schedule. I, you know, I'm just I'm trying to get my payphone open. And then I see Johannes. And Johannes says, oh, are, are you coming to my talk at one? And I'm like, yep, I knew exactly that. Uh, so Johannes has a, has a portable microphone. He's going to be doing a very unconventional talk. It's his first talk without slides, actually. Is that right? That's true. That's true. That, that's true. Don't, don't forget. No, unicorns. No, there, there will be unicorns. I promise you that. No. If we don't have any unicorns by 1.30, we will, we will deliver unicorns. Um, You're not running the conference. You can't offer that. It's the last day of the conference. I can offer whatever I want, because what are you going to do? Come find me tomorrow? <laughs> All right, so, so he, he's going to be going throughout the audience. He has a lot of interesting stuff to say. The room's filling up. Um, you guys know the, all the rules about aisles and stuff like that. If you have a free seat in the middle of the aisle, there's compress. Yeah, there's stuff here. Come, forward. There's Come forward. It might not help you any, any way because I might go to the back, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if, if, you're, if you're at all afraid of Johannes, he might come to you directly. So please, everybody, a huge, gigantic Hope awesome. X round of applause yeah. for Johannes. <laughs> Thank you. Ha! Ah. I'm actually not, yeah, everyone, like the last two days, people came to me and said, like, ah, I'm looking forward to Sunday, the roast, the roast, the roast. I actually don't even know the cultural re relevance of what a roast is. I googled it and like, ah, roasting. It's like when comedians like roast other comedians. and this, that, this. Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, I'll try my best to tell you why I all hate you. Um, <laughs> Or no, actually, I only hate you a little bit. But okay, let's say I'm interested in the great dichotomies of life. I'm interested in black and white and cats and dogs and love and hate. And there's a little bit of hate in here today. The main uh, reason why I'm here is because I've been part of the hacker community, although some people do not consider me part of the hacker community. It's just like call me artist. They say, oh, he's just the artist. He's like the crazy Austrian artist. But I've been part of the hacker community for quite some time. And there are some things that I just don't get. I just like, why, 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 why is it happening all the time in the hacker community for 10 years now or 15 years now and it's not changing. It's even getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And I want to spit it at you a little bit today. Um, and then I'll feel better and get drunk. Okay, so first of all, uh, the one thing that all hackers, hack hackers and hackresses should read Hectresis or something. I don't know what the female version. Hectresis, I'll, I'll, I'll use that, is one book by a great, crazy German, and his name is Werner Herzog. Who knows Werner Herzog? Yeah, that's good. I love you already, you fuckers. Okay, so uh, Werner Herzog is a great uh, German um, director, and he made a couple of really great films, and one of those films is called Fitzcarraldo. You know Fitzcarraldo? Fitzcarraldo is one of the best films ever made. And Bes the making of Fitzcarraldo. And the making of Fitzcarraldo. And this book in my hand is called Eroberung des Nutzlosen. That sounds like a war camp or something. No, it means, uh, yeah, I'm from Austria. Austria is known for music and mass murder, so that, there you have it. Uh, so uh, Eroberung des Nutzlosen means the conquest of the useless. And it's uh, a print of Werner Herzog's uh, diaries or diary that he wrote while he shot Fitzcarraldo for like two or three years. The basic idea of Fitzcarraldo is that there is a guy played by Klaus Kinski and that guy wants to build an opera house in the middle of the fucking jungle. And there we have the first hacker relevance here, like we are all people who want to build opera houses in the middle of the fucking jungle. Yeah? So. Uh, some of us fail, some of us not. But that guy wants to build an opera house in the fucking jungle. He wants to do it with the money that he makes with rubber trade. But it doesn't really work. Uh, so he needs to carry, he needs to drag a big boat, a ship, over a mountain range to another river. 
Uh, and that's the story of the film and how he tries to make money to build an opera house by dragging a ship over a mountain. Yeah? And the problem is, or actually the greatness of that film is, that Werner Herzog not only shot a film about that, he did it. He dragged a ship over a mountain range in the middle of the fucking rainforest somewhere. Yeah? And that's his diary, how he did that. Read it, you will never be the same again, I have to say, it's, uh, I have to tell you. Because that tells so much about passion, about love, about hate, also about like the very fascism we, we confront ourselves with, like the, our, our, when our dreams suddenly become uh, kind of like what they not should be, like, like, like the opposite of dreams, nightmares, where we confront other people with our own dreams who became nightmares and that kind of stuff. So please read it, The Conquest of the Useless. That's my opening remark here uh, for the so-called roast, or let's call it 2,000 calories of Alfredo. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing I see going on, going on, going on, and especially in the last couple of years, hacker culture is interestingly dominated, um, not, let's not call it dominated, but obsessed. Obsessed with one thing, and it's martyrdom. Martyrdom, martyrdom, martyrdom. Uh, and martyrdom in a strange combination with stardom. There are people, I mean, you pretty much saw it yesterday with Snowden. Everyone was cramming their stupid bodies into this tiny little room over there <laughs> to see a virtual presentation of a guy who said the same things that he says all the time. And you know, yeah, but it's Snowden, it's Snowden, he's Snowden. <laughs> Snowden, I love you, make me a child, really, it's really, <laughs> that guy is nice, he did great things, but no one in the entire world deserves so much attention, really, <laughs> no one, yeah, uh, and I'm not saying that uh, because I mean, I don't even know Snowden, yeah, I like what he did, the main problem with that kind of discourse, if you have really complex problems in our world, like the stuff with the NSA, like other stuff, uh, like other stuff, uh, we tend as human people to personify discourse. And that's what's most of the time not good for the discourse. It's not good for talking about things by talking about people who talk about things. Because you end up talking about the people, and the people are unimportant, really, they are. Snowden is not important. What Snowden did is important, and what it cost. But Snowden is not Michael Jackson, and no one should be Michael Jackson, really, no one. <laughs> because you see what happened to Michael Jackson? Yes. He killed himself, yes. Uh, the same is true for Assange. I think that Assange is one of the biggest assholes I know. <laughs> he did some really great things. Yes, he did. But at one point, that fucker should have just like stepped off the stage. He should just have gone away and leave the project to itself and the other people running it and just take his fucking stupid face out of the equation. Yeah? He should have done that. Yeah? Uh, I have never met Assange. But I have a strange reaction to him appearing everywhere and everyone talking about him. The guy's a guy. It's like, I'm, no, I'm not hating him, not really, no. He's a guy who did something really important. Uh, but the problem was that the importance of the person Assange suddenly became bigger than WikiLeaks. And it actually killed WikiLeaks. And that's the biggest sin that was committed in this whole process. Of course, the media are part of that. The media want to personify discourse. They want to have the face of Assange and talk about Assange. They don't want to talk about WikiLeaks. They want to talk about Assange. They don't want to talk about the NSA. They want to talk about Snowden. They don't want to talk about CryptoLeaks. They want to talk about Applebaum! <laughs> uh, that's what they want to do. And I like Jake Applebaum, but fuck Applebaumics, really. Yeah. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. I mean, he was so big when I first him met. He's like, nice guy, yeah? But no, 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 no. Because there is something weird going on in our brains if too many people are running after a person and saying, Jake, you, it's so great. You're, it's, 
Jake is not Christ, yeah? But some people think that he's Christ. They're almost praying to him, and that's where the whole martyrdom comes in. Martyrdom is something that people really like. They like to be the martyrs. They like to be the ones who have the feeling. It's kind of like an exchange, uh, like it's a strange economy. It's like, I'm the martyr. I do all the wonderful things. I get kicked, I get fucked by the FBI and whoever else, but I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. I'm your martyr, and I want to be loved by you, yeah? And that strange dynamic uh, is going on all the time, everywhere, and it has to be stopped, and it can only be stopped by not running after those people. It's not giving them this, like, the whole, the whole idea of the yes men is so interestingly contrived because the biggest yes men are the followers of the yes men. <laughs> It's almost ironic, yeah? And the same thing is for people who, who are into, con uh, uh, into dissent. Uh, I mean, even the website of hope is presenting faces. It's presenting faces of people who we should worship because they did something really great. Yes, they did it. But actually, the facts are important. What they want to do, the politics is important and not who did that political thing. Uh, to a certain extent, I mean, I, I don't want to go into details here, but uh, there are many things like that. Martin looked at Luther King Day and that kind of stuff. I mean, we have an urge to do something. We want to thank someone for doing something really great. In the end, uh, some people know Martin Luther King, but they don't know what he did. And that's not how it should happen. One second. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, uh, we like worshipping, we shouldn't. It's a person-centric debate. We discuss the, the fallacies, fallacies of people at certain points, like Assange is the best example, when we should talk about the project itself. Uh, it's a debate about single people when it should be a debate about content and about theory and about themes. Uh, it's actually anti-topic. It's uh, quite easy to... Uh, to not reflect on topics when you talk about, about people. Uh, dissidents as heroes is okay. I mean, people do great things and that's, that's perfect, but the problems with the very notion of heroism is a problem. It's a very, I mean, I'm using the term now and you probably will misunderstand it because I'm a European leftist, but I don't like liberals. <laughs> uh, liberal discourse means that there, there are certain liberal virtues. You know, there is, uh, the hero is a very liberal virtue. The hero is someone we have to thank for, for doing something. The hero is a really crazy narrative because the hero is like a one person and that one person does something really great. Uh, and it's like, you know, like, uh, like Frodo, yeah? Everyone is talking about Frodo, yeah? Uh, <laughs> Nobody's talking about the other hobbits and, and you know, like uh, a struggle is always a struggle of people and groups and usually not the struggle of one single person. Even the whole discourse about Aaron Schwartz that is really, really super tragic is actually a discourse about the whole scene and people who did not support him or supported him or whatever it is. Yeah? Uh, of course, it can be transported over the person very tragically, but that's not how it uh, should be. So the, the story of the hero, the hero narrative is uh, destroying a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, the same uh, stuff is going on when, especially in the US, all the debates about, I should move around. <laughs> yeah, so all the debates in the US are factually, in the US hacker scene, are, am I breaking your necks? Is it okay? <laughs> Turn on. Move the chairs if you like. You can, you can do that. It's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. That's, that, that, that's good. That's good. That's good. She got it! Yes, she got it. Okay. And it is about freedom. It's about the wonderful terms we have here. Freedom and liberty and constitution and we the citizens and all that kind of stuff. The main problem is that all those words mean nothing. In fact, they're all bourgeois crap. Uh, what is liberty? What is a freedom? Where is it? What, what, what does, what's, what's a fucking constitution? Can, you, can someone really explain what the fucking constitution is to me? The main problem is that we are, especially in the hacker scene, we like to point that out. I am a citizen. The NSA is doing bad things against me. I am a citizen of the US. Nobody gives a shit, really. <laughs> uh, 
Of, it's a fucking state in a fucking capitalist system. That's what it is. Yeah. What do you expect to happen? Yeah. Of course, you can say like, I'm a citizen. I'm a proud citizen of the U.S. And I don't like what the NSA did to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, like capitalism is 200 years old and it fucked everything up ever since. Uh, the very notion of freedom does not exist. The very moment I have to earn money to live makes me unfree. I'm unfree from the very second that I get born, you know? And fighting for something like freedom is almost like fighting for, I don't know, what is it? It is a strange term. We want freedom, we want liberty, we want the upholding of the Constitution. All of that stuff is just like that's templates, you know? Like, don't use those stupid templates. Nobody needs them, yeah? Talk about the basics. Talk about what that freedom means to you. And most people that I talk to find out that they actually don't mean what other people mean with freedom. Because I could talk to you, and you say a completely different definition of what, what he believes is freedom than she believes that freedom is, yeah? And most discourses, especially in the hacker scene, are about words and terms and beliefs, and I could guarantee you half of the people in this room here do not agree with the other half of the room when they talk about terms like liberty and freedom and constitution and rights. I'm pretty sure about that, yeah? So uh, we have to go back to the basics. It's not just, it's not that easy. It's not that easy, and sometimes hackers make it very easy for themselves. Okay, so uh, the next one is that hackers have a strange ignorance towards history. Many, many, many have. There uh, is a narrow-sightedness, I would call it. Many people, especially young hackers, are not interested in what happened in the 90s, are not interested in what happened in the 70s. The whole debate about hackerspaces, I wrote a stupid pamphlet about it a couple of years ago. Of course, it didn't change anything. But hackerspaces are pretty much as a concept as old as the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah? Still, people believe that they are reinventing uh, the wheel. They believe that, that all the stuff that's happening right now, that like hackerspaces are like sausage fests with like 95% whale fuckers in there. Yeah? Uh, uh, male fuckers, not whale fuckers, uh, of course. <laughs> whale fuckers maybe. Yeah? Uh, that's like, I mean, there is, a, there is a background to that. It's not that that background is naturally rooted in hacker culture. Some of it is, yeah? But I mean, we live in a fucking patriarchy. That's why, yeah? And that's why certain jobs and certain segments of society are highly male-dominated, some are highly female-dominated, and this and that, and that. I'm not even talking about, like, transgender and rah, That, I mean, he, oh, oh, my God, yeah? Uh, so the problem is that the historical dimensions of our movement, of the hacker movement, is most of the time completely ignored by hackers. Hackers are a subculture, or think they are a subculture, uh, but never think about, I mean, it's almost like someone doesn't know that that Kennedy's and likes punk nowadays. I mean, who likes punk nowadays anyways? But uh, that's the problem. So like, yeah, I don't know the dead Kennedy's. Why should I know the dead Kennedy's? Is, is, is any, any importance? I like guitars. Uh, yeah, I like, yeah, but it's boring. It's boring and doesn't lead us anywhere. Okay, so on a positive side, I have to say, there is a reduction uh, I have to see in the last couple of years of stupid infights. So uh, you don't see people anymore walking around and like, I don't want to talk to you because you use Red Hat and I use SUSE or something like that. So like that kind of stuff is actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller that like Linux distribution infights and that kind of bullshit, yeah? At the same time, I have to say, it transcended into something even worse that people sometimes have quarrels about that they don't, like, if I would not understand the joke on your t-shirt, you would suddenly have, like, a grudge against me. I, I really had that a couple of times, that people, like, they were showing off their shirts, or I didn't, I looked at their shirts, and I didn't understand it, and they would pretty much, like, walk away. <laughs> Why is that? It's strange. It's strange because, and the very core of that thing is that hacker culture and hackers like to create their uh, specialness or their elitism in strange, strange ways. And sometimes that elitism is even played out with jokes, you know, like, uh, I get the joke, you don't get the joke, I'm better than you, okay? And that's not how it, uh, how it should be. Uh, so the t-shirt joke uproar, I would call it. It's in a certain way uh, a misunderstanding of the concept of underground and, and subversion. Many hackers 
uh, think that they are subversive, that they are underground. In fact, I actually believe, and I'm almost sure, that hacker culture is no underground or alternative culture anymore. Hacker culture is pretty much mainstream. Hacker culture and nerd culture is mainstream. Maybe alternative mainstream, but it is mainstream. Uh, what emerges out of that problem that you are part of a group of people that thinks it is underground, but actually got up to a point that they're at least alternative mainstream, uh, is a problem in self, in, 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 in how, how the scene sees itself. Uh, an example. Uh, there's an example in, in Germany. It's a completely different field, and you don't know that guy, so I don't even name, uh, name him. Uh, it's a German uh, comedian, and that comedian was really uh, popular in the 1980s. And he was a high critic of, uh, uh, of alternative uh, mainstream culture, and he attacked that. So he was attacking the, green, the Greens in, uh, in, in Germany, for example. For I think his basic shtick was... Uh, uh, back to plastic or something like that. So he was, you know, like he turned the stuff around. He was criticizing liberal mainstream for, for how hi hypocritic it was, yeah? That guy is in the meantime uh, one of the biggest and most important comedians uh, in Germany doing the same jokes like 30 years ago. Uh, for example, he's doing uh, like pretty much racist jokes about Polish people and stuff like that. Uh, and he's doing that, of course, because he makes meta jokes about that we should not make jokes about Polish people, but he's, he's making fun about people who make jokes about Polish people, but 95% of the audience just like don't get the meta. They just think he's making fun about Polish people. And that's a little bit the problem of, of subculture and subcultural discourses and, and grammars when they emerge into mainstream culture. It's that you just like you have to change the perspective how to speak and how to act and what your privilege is, your privilege check, check as a subculture is different than when you're actually getting into the mainstream culture. And we are pretty much mainstream. I mean, with like Snowden and Assange and all that stuff going on, uh, I mean, the, the world is looking at us and what we are doing. And we should behave uh, in a way like we are not in a punk club anymore. <laughs> so if we combine, uh, co compare, compare the hacker scene with a punk club, we are not in a punk club anymore. And there are certain rules of behavior and certain rules of how we speak as groups and as individuals in the hacker community. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't translate anymore. And that translation period is really, really uh, harsh sometimes. Some elements of the whole misogyny and sexism uh, in nerd cultures is part of that scene. Uh, the whole debate at the Chaos uh, Communication Congress the last two years about and DEF CON about creeper cards and all that kind of stuff, I'm not getting into details about that. But the main problem is that if people within the hacker community criticize things within the hacker community, they are being, uh, in a certain way, outcast. They're, they're, they're outcastify people. Yeah? Uh, that means, oh, you're criticizing the hacker scene. You were running around with creeper cards. Uh, although those people were part of the scene, suddenly members of the scene said, no, 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 they're not. They're outsiders. So they are, we are part of this group called hackers. And people come into this group and criticize us for things. And they, but they're not even us. So it's kind of like this, uh, this process of like, creating external enemies. And that's quite easy uh, if you have the feeling that you are part of this like, elitist, small, underground culture. It's quite easy to blame people from outside. They are attacking us. People want to, to destroy our way of life. They want to destroy our beliefs. They want to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. And of course, most of the time, that's just not true. But it's this like, standard... Uh, uh, way that like, you know, like in the punk club, if like people come into the door and they don't look like punks, uh, the punks will look at them and say like, what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah? In the meantime, uh, there is a, so like punks could at the same time not look like punks, you know, you know what I mean? It's like the, 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 the appearance, how we are, how we behave is not, not we are not a, a, a homogenous, like a homogenous um, scene. So, so Please, please be aware of that. Okay, okay. Next one. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, to a certain extent, sometimes we are fighting the wrong enemies. Uh, so sometimes within the scene, there are things going on that are sometimes 
worth fighting, but those fights are not being fought because there is a strange, like, no, we, we shouldn't do that. I mean, I would call that, uh, sometimes we have to stick it to the stall man. Let's call it that way, yeah? <laughs> so, uh, uh, the way is, uh, sometimes it's really more important to, to, to have a discussion within the scene than, uh, like, in a political way, it's like, people like to run around with big banners saying, I hate George W. Bush. Of course, no problem. Yeah, it's a quite easy way to do that. If you, you, people like to criticize stuff that's easy to criticize, and you criticize uh, that stuff easily because you have a consent in the community. Sometimes there is consent in the community and, uh, about things, and that's the stuff we like to talk about because we want to like, tap on each other's shoulder and say, like, ah, oh, that's really nice. I, I, it's really great that you also hate George W. Bush. That's <laughs> great, yeah. Sometimes it's probably better to talk about other things that maybe generate a little bit more drama and, and friction, but that's, I think, important, and that's why I would call that the the Stallman problem. Um, okay, so uh, the non-reflection of privileges, we definitely still have to talk about that, about ethnical uh, problems, social and class problems, especially also, also class problems, and the problems of knowledge. Uh, let's call it that way that uh, hacker culture uh, is a culture that is based on knowing things. We are all people, we're all clever people, we have our um, levels of, of knowledge and uh, things that we are pretty much like experts in. A problem emerges if that expertdom is being played out as elitism. And that's uh, like one of the main problems, I think, in hacker culture is that the privilege of knowing something is exploited many, many, many times. So in hacker spaces, I've seen it many times, hacker spaces should actually work as education centers, where I go because I want to learn something, and people uh, um, are there that I can learn from, and the other way around. Most of the time, it's the same with like the, the, the t-shirt joke. It's like, oh, I'm just taking something really silly. I know Python, eh? What have you got, huh? <laughs> That way, uh, so that, that this, this difference of knowledge is not something uh, positive in a way that I know something I want to teach you, and you know something and you teach me, but suddenly it's, it's a currency. It's a currency, and that currency creates mini stars, and that all ends up with Apple Bomb. No, not really with Apple Bomb, but <laughs> you, you know where I get to, yeah? That you have like a strange form of meritocracy that is based on elitism. Like in Wikipedia, for example, I always say Wikipedia is the world's biggest multiplayer game. Uh, and it's about hierarchical elitism, yeah? Wikipedia does not work because people want to extend the knowledge of the planet. It exists because they want to fuck people over. That's why, yeah? It's because there are rules in the game, and you can win the game, and you can outsmart other people and delete other people's pages, etc., etc., etc. So there's a certain gamification going on in Wikipedia, and that same gamification is sometimes going on in the hacker scene, and it ends up in like, look at my schlong! Ah! Uh, no, no, it should not happen that way. So uh, there is a certain, I have to say, closeness of, of hectum to capitalist structures, of course. I mean, that's important for me because I'm a neo-Marxist, but what can I say? Uh, that uh, it is no problem that like a security engineer, for example, uh, um, is working for Google and at the same time is writing codes for the community and for the hacker scene. Uh, I mean, on the, on the one hand, it's not a big deal. I mean, people have to, to, to make a living, they have to work. Especially in a high technical field, people have to do that. At the same time, that, that uh, like, kind of like uh, being with one leg in one completely different field of life and with one leg in another one is sometimes str a strange twist, I have to say. So, and some people do really horrifying things in their, in their day job and they try to do the super good things in the hacker community. And sometimes I've seen people being ripped apart, apart by that. It's really, it's, it's, uh, it's, some people don't, don't manage well in that differentiation of their, like, let's call it the, uh, the schizophrenia of, of the tech world, yeah? So be aware of that. I mean, I know that that cannot be stopped because people have to earn a living in, in some way. And I'm, I'm, I don't think that we will abolish, uh, abolish wage slavery in the near future. 
But just like if you think about that, like try to, to analyze yourself or psychoanalyze yourself. Uh, what is really going on in your brain when you're working at Google, if you work at Google, and when you're going to hope? Is this the same person? What's going on? I think postmodern theory can help a lot about like the, the fragmentation of, of modern brains. And I think, uh, think about that a little bit. Uh, there is the paper. Um, one, one element, for example, I've seen is the whole Elon Musk thing that happened a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago when Elon Musk was giving away uh, like patents for free. It's like he was opening the patents for certain energy cells for blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Yeah? I could not believe how like everyone, everyone, Elon Musk is a hero. He's so great. He's opening like he's giving away for free the stuff that he could make money with, like this patent, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Elon Musk is great and he will bring us to space, but he's a fucker, yeah, really. I mean, he's, he, 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 he created fucking PayPal! <laughs> and remember! Yes, I know it's cool! He builds rockets and we all want to fly to space because we're all individualists. Yes, we know, yeah. I like, I like rockets. I like that, yeah. But that guy is not a good one. He is not a good one. He is not good. That doesn't mean that NASA is good, yeah? But he's not a good one, yeah. Okay, so please, Tame, tame it down a little bit. When someone does something that fits into your mind and into your belief system, but not really, no, that guy gave away a patent. But most of the time, I think you would not agree with what he thinks and does, okay? So please be aware that it's just like, uh, don't form, I would call it, uh, sometimes alliances suck and don't go into those alliances even if it's only in your brain yeah elon musk is not cool just because he gave a patent away for free okay in the same way like greenwald for example greenwald nice guy does great things uh, at the same time that guy is uh, uh, um, a blatant open uh, perpetrator because he thinks that the wall between uh, Mexico and the US is necessary and he's defending it. I mean, I'm not for a wall between Mexico and the US. I'm against walls. I'm an anti-nationalist. Anti and in the same way, uh, so that stuff, I mean, Greenwald, nice, yeah? But please, 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 the whole martyr thing and the whole stardom thing, like, no, no. Please disagree with the people that you like. With, uh, as often as possible, challenge them, yeah? Like, so if Greenwald is doing one of his interview sessions again, or this and that and blah, 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 it's like asking about the, ask about the wall. Tell me about the wall. And yeah, so, okay. Uh, so there are sometimes very monothematic um, causal chains that I really don't get. Just, and that's maybe also related to the whole thing of like no history or history lessness or people are not interested in complex uh, things that go on. And sometimes it's really just easier to believe that 9-11 was an inside job. No, it was not. Uh, so, but you know, we like easy solutions and we like to form alliances with people we should actually sometimes not do. Uh, even now, I'll just like say it again. Uh, I know that Israel can be really fucky, yeah? But that's not why you should be on the side of Hamas, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, you know that's the point, yeah. Uh, it's just like they're, they, no, no, it's weird, weird, weird liberal brains do weird things. Uh, and I do not understand them sometimes. Okay, so misogyny and exclusionism, check. <laughs> uh, especially hackerspaces, check. Information-based economy, I talked about it a little bit. It's not about education, it's about elitism. Break it down. Teaching versus show off, I already talked about that before. The sloppiness of definitions. I like definitions because uh, without definitions, we are in the, in the vast field of the structurelessness, the tyranny of the structurelessness. Uh, for example, for me, there is a significant difference between a hackerspace a maker space, a fab lab, and a co-working space. There is a difference, yeah. There is a difference. And no, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing to call it a maker space than calling it a hacker space, or calling it a fab lab, or, my God, a co-working space. Don't touch that name, don't touch it. Please do not, yeah. <laughs> that are, that are different things. It's just like, it's like saying like, yeah, you know, like, Marxism is like, I don't know, uh, 
Yeah, something. It's it's probably more like uh, Trotsky's. Uh, Trotskyists are not Leninists or something like that. But that would be a little bit more uh, to debate right now. But anyhow, what I mean with that is, please be careful in your discussions and how you present yourself, because everything you say is generating an effect. The whole one example. Uh, we would not have the debate about privacy and email if email would have been called e-postcards from the very beginning. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. By calling something something, you evoke an image in your mind. And mail is something that's protected. But no, I mean, there is a difference between mail and email, yeah? And just by calling it email doesn't mean, like, people think that email is secure, but of course it's not. But people think it's secure because it's called email. Or the same thing, like global warming. If we would have called it atmosphere cancer from the very beginning. <laughs> We would not have the debate right now. So be careful how you call things because that stuff might stick forever, yeah? Like that stupid term of the black hole. <laughs> yeah, someone came up with the term black hole. It's not black, you know, it's I, I, whatever, yeah? So, especially in a field like yours where every day stuff is being created, invented, named, just like don't call it Doge something. <laughs> <laughs> but like think about what the name of something means to people and what it conveys and what it will probably mean in 10 years and not now, okay? So I know memes are really nice and so, but I know that dogs will be really nice still in 10 years, but I know, <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Uh, well, what do we have here? Uh, the sloppiness of definitions in all forms. The generational change I've seen, like coming to Hope, for example, in the last 10 years, there's something going on that there is, uh, like new people are coming in, uh, and new people, young people, are adopting bad patterns that are emerging. And uh, <clears throat> let, let's say that way. Uh, I think that the hierarchies in the hacker scene are generally, they were pretty flat, just like 15, 20 years ago, but because there are more people and because people like to organize themselves, the hierarchies are getting a little bit more steeper. That's also related to the whole elitism thing and that I know more than you and blah, blah, blah. Try to fight it as, 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 as much as possible. I know that there are certain things, certain uh, hierarchies have to be kept up and it would be bad to not keep them because then we end up in the tyranny of the structurelessness. That's actually a term from the 1970s uh, feminist movement where feminist groups were falling apart because they couldn't agree on rules and rule sets. Uh, and because they tried to, to kind of like ban the man because they thought uh, that having rules in a group would actually mean that we invited the man into our group. But that's not true. I mean, people need certain rule sets, need, need certain sets of behaviors. And if those behaviors uh, are broken in some way, then of course we can negotiate about that, but it's okay to have structures. It, that's, not a big, that's not a big problem. Uh, and... Uh, some hierarchies and some structures that just emerge uh, are bad, uh, and that should not happen. And I've seen many, many young people uh, run around and ask for this and do that and blah, 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 blah. And some of them, like, sometimes they ask crazy things that I do not know why they're asking. Also, for example, in the Viennese hackerspace, there are sometimes 15, 16 year old people coming, and they are adopting behaviors and things that are not inherent in the scene, that should not be part of the scene, that are just like strange side effects that I'm criticizing, but they believe that is how the hacker scene works. And they adopt that and they, and they, and they, and they keep on breeding it, let's call it that way. So think about the stuff that you're doing wrong and try to not teach people who come into the scene the same wrong beliefs and the same wrong things, yeah? Uh, sometimes, of course, you have to be uh, self-aware about that kind of stuff, yeah? But still, uh, you are really teaching the next generation of people of our community, and sometimes you're doing it wrong, and uh, that's, not, that's not good. Let, how much time do I have left, actually? I don't know. Okay, okay, I'm ready. I'm going I'm fast, 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 fast. Anti-theory. I don't get why so many hackers are so anti-theory. Uh, is anyone actually in here, like, please, please, who says, like, I don't know, I, I'm not interested in theory. I don't think that theory helps me in my life and helps the hacker community. Anyone here? Please, please do so, if you, if you think so. What? I mean, okay, good, 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 good. A solutionist. He is a solutionist. 
Uh, I think it's way more here, and you just don't know what I'm, what I'm speaking of, I guess. Uh, so what I mean is that, especially if, um, in, in the hacker community, there's a certain tendency to get shit done. Yeah? But sometimes it's good to think about the stuff before getting it done. Uh -huh. uh, and that's what I would call a solutionist. And sometimes that term is also used in a different form. It's called the duocracy. Yeah? The people who do something are the ones who are in charge. You know how inherently fascist that is. <laughs> Just because I'm doing something, I'm right? That's not true. That is not true. It is complete and utter bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and I know because it's also a perspective of privilege. Because in a hackerspace, for example, it could mean just because I have more time than you, because I have a better job than you, I can spend more time at the hackerspace. What? And no children, etc., etc., etc. That's all privilege, and that means like I run the bureaucracy because I'm privileged. And no, 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 do it. I'm not talking about Foucault and his fucking pendulum, you know, that's a different Foucault, yeah? I'm talking about Michel Foucault, uh, a French philosopher, who did a lot of research and thinking about power structures and hierarchies and uh, the state of, uh, pr primarily of course, like France and the Western uh, society in the 70s because he died uh, in the early 1980s. But still, Foucault has a couple of really good points that would solve many, many of our problems here in hackerspaces, in the community, if we would all have read it. So, I mean, I think there should be something like a mandatory reading list of theory for every hacker and hackress out there, I think. There are like probably 20 books. And it probably takes you like half a year to read them, but you should. And I might at one point just like make that list and spit it in your face. But I was always thinking, you can find it yourself. I want to let you do it yourself. But I think I have to do that. <laughs> and I don't like it, but whatever. Yeah. So, uh, anti-theory, reflection is bad, a dead end of awareness, blah, 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 blah. But drama is important. I know that many people here don't like drama. And there's always the whole thing like noise bridge is horrible, horrible, horrible noise bridge. You have all the drama all the time. And the drama, 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 drama. I think. Uh, most of the time, when something is called drama, it just means that someone who doesn't think the topic is important is calling it drama. If there is like some misogyny going on, oh, drama, 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 yeah. No, no, it's not drama. It's just like, there has to be a discourse before you call something drama, yeah? What I mean is, what is important, and that's why I adopt the term drama in a, in a positive sense. I like drama, I embrace drama because because, because drama means friction, and friction means debate, and debate means talking to each other, and not just like sitting on your computers in a hackerspace where you should actually do something together, yeah? So, uh, debate uh, equals drama for me because it's generating friction, and I know sometimes people get burnt, but people do not only get burnt uh, in the hacker scene, it's pretty much everywhere, it's a human, you know, like human or fuckers, deal with it, okay, yeah? Uh, Sometimes you have to deal more with it than other times, but just see that you are people within a social uh, field, and I know for many people that social field is a conundrum, and they do not understand it. Uh, uh, it's not even an excuse to say that, uh, that, that you have Asperger's or something like that. Sometimes not even like non-Asperger's don't understand what's going on, uh, but just like deal with it, you know? Um, uh, Kristen Stubbs gave a great talk yesterday about uh, her being a sex geek, uh, it's like, just like sometimes think about just behave in a normal way and deal with people in a normal way that you would, you know, it's, just, it's not that hard. Just like, <sighs> hello. <laughs> no? That first step, first step. Not, <gasps> no, no. Um, good. Okay. Hello. Hello is a good start. Um, 
So drama is important because it's dynamic, and what we need in the scene is dynamics. It's not a problem that some people don't like a hackerspace, create their own hackerspace, have a feminist hackerspace, whatever it is. That's all emergence out of drama, out of friction, because at, you never know. Like in, in Vienna, for example, there is a new feminist hackerspace, and most of those members of the feminist hackerspace are actually returning to the, to the other hackerspace now because they're actually missing the debate. They're missing that, that, they, that they can change uh, a system from within and are trying to do that. So uh, just because uh, there is like splitting up of groups or something like that, that's not per se a problem. The problem emerges if the solidarity between those uh, groups completely evaporates. So you can have a different task, you can have different important things in your life, but just like keep in mind that, I mean, Individualism is really nice and really important, especially in the US, but there is also solidarity, and solidarity is one of the founding moments, I think, of hacker culture. We are a group that is dependent on each other. And do not forget that. We are almost a union for the good in the world, so please do that. Please, please do that. Um, so, drama, blah, 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 the Chinese, blah, 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 uh, the blindness, uh, of, of the peers, let's call it that way, that's a side effect and a bad effect of that is that, that try, to, n try to not see the peer group you're in as something so important that you abandon uh, other things. So like, kind of like the, the, whole, the whole Nazi problem, you know? <laughs> uh, so the Völkische, the Völkische movement. We're not, we should not be a Völkische movement. So it's uh, just because you're part of a scene doesn't mean you have to defend that scene at any cost. You should not do that, yeah? Okay. Uh, I mentioned that before in the case of like the creeper card incidents and all this. Even calling it creeper card incident is really strange actually. Yeah? But five minutes, okay. Uh, so be aware that there should be active dissent within the community and not just like, we're not dissenting as a community against the evil in the world. Sometimes the evil in the world is right in our midst and we should sometimes see that. Sometimes it's even ourselves and we don't see it. So if someone criticizes you for something that you did, don't just like freak out and say like, no, you're wrong and I do whatever I like. And I, I know it, like some hackers think they are the big anarchists of the world and then they're just like stupid libertarians. It's always... Uh, but, um, ah, whatever. Um, so, so, reputation in the hacker scene is, to a certain extent, everything, and also nothing. So, don't be so keen on your high reputation. Individualis uh, individualism is good, but don't forget solidarity. I mentioned that already. And as my last point is, I know we can have lots of debates. I mean, I have a different political view than many of you probably have. Uh, I think... Uh, that the one thing, I mean, <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, but I still would call it the repetism. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is is like try to be not too ideologically flexible in your belief system. So try to stick with what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, everyone can change his or her mind whenever they like to. Yeah. But it's kind of strange that some people like like have like a certain mindset and suddenly flip it. Like, I'm like, wow, I, why? <laughs> why, what is going on here? Uh, without having any self-reflection about that stuff, yeah? Or that they are, um, I don't know. So uh, I have to say, uh, in a certain, let, let's, call that, let's call that also the friendly fuckover. So sometimes there are so many friendly fuckovers uh, that I want to puke, <laughs> okay? So, um, Try to be consistent uh, a little bit sometimes and make it, and make it easier for you and other people. Uh, especially that's connected to the whole reputation thing. Like I, I can, I mean, I understand if people want to make money. I understand that people want to create companies and this and that and blah, blah, blah. I understand that people want to protect things they created. Uh, but if you create something as part of a group, especially for example, a hackerspace or an open source project, I mean, please, have a debate internally. We all know that the open source uh, scene and and certain like collective collective processes, yeah, collective processes create uh, friction in the sense of that people usually do not talk 
about who, like who owns it, you know? Uh, of course, officially nobody owns that. Nobody owns an open source project. But people in their minds and in their, in, in their thinking of it and how, how they perceive a project have a clear vision of that. Many people say, like, I did most of that fucking kernel. Yeah? And the problem starts if another person says, like, no, you didn't. <laughs> so really, like, economy, especially economy of, of uh, uh, like, social economy, uh, is important. And talk about that beforehand. Because that stuff uh, ends up in fights that are really horrifying and don't help anyone is sometimes killing really wonderful projects. If you Deal with that beforehand. If you, it's almost like 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 having sex. It's good to talk about something before you have sex. Well, while having sex, finding out that the other person does not want to be strangled, uh, <laughs> you might run into difficulties. <laughs> So, before you start an open source project or any kind of collaborative project, talk about if the people want to get strangled. <laughs> yeah? Set up a rule set. How you are going to do that. It's, it's, it's so important. That's one of the most important things you can do in an open source project is talking about who wants to invest, what time, what energy, how should the project end up, how much time do we give each other. You know, everything that should take two days, takes two years. It's, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff. So please, uh, I think I'll end here with my, my little rant. And thank you that you're still here and don't feel too offended, hopefully. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>